And no amount of attention or love from others can make up from the hole in your heart that's from a lack of love from yourself, a lack of friendship from yourself. And actually, I'll I'll share an example here too. You know, I, I teach at Yale University and I have some colleagues who did, who ran a study looking at Yale University's emotions. And they, they, you know, what does this elite group of kids, elite group of young adults feel? Oh, they must feel very successful. They're like part of the 0.225% who get into Yale, right? Guess what emotions they feel the most? Stress, anxiety. (laughs) Rest and tired, exactly. And then when you ask them, what emotion do you most want to feel? Guess what it is? Is it love? Approve acceptance? Loved. You get that, Eileen, because you're so perceptive. But it's exactly that. It's like no amount of success that they are burning themselves into the ground trying to attain. Yeah, it does not equal that love that they're looking for. That they're looking for because that love can only actually come from themselves because they are abusing themselves in the process of looking for it. And if you're abusing yourself, you will never feel happy no matter how many people love you. Mm-hmm. Eileen, I, I see that in the students. I see it in the faculty. I see it in the staff. I see it in all high achieving environments. And I think, wow, <laughs> you know, how do you, and, you know, for those parents out there, it's like, oh, you want, you want a high achieving kid? You know, I, I don't want to tell you how to make that happen because it's sad, you know, but I do believe you can be, but being sovereign is showing up at your fullest potential, but it's showing up. You're going to show up at your fullest potential when you're on your own side. Right. With love, <laughs> supporting yourself. I'm also a high achieving person growing up. So I totally relate to all of those issues, right? Needing to prove yourself, seeking the love and approval of others. And it's it, it's through this personal growth journey that I really learned to just give love back to myself. It was never about the goals. <laughs> it was never about anything external. I love that. And, that, and that's why you can teach that others. And it's, you know, that's one of the things like I, I wrote my book Sovereign with this idea. I want this for Gen Z because they learn this because the other generations have not figured this out and they're not creating very nice model for everyone else to follow. Right. They've passed down this belief system. They've passed down the traumas. Mm Mm-hmm pass down the traumas and it's like the buck has to stop here because i honestly think like the where our planet is right now where our environment is the wars everything that stuff doesn't happen when people don't have trauma it's true you know yeah wars it can't happen if people don't show up to fight them mm-hmm. and once our internal battles are, are no, we don't have that internal battle we're not going to have battles with others once you start honoring yourself you also honor others and you realize oh we're all the same. We're all one people. No, I'm so with you on every single word. Yep. (laughs) Yeah. So I think we both get it. And I think our listeners, some of them get it. Some of them might still be struggling with it. I know that, you know, people with this type of trauma, sometimes this trauma is so useful and it helps them become so productive that they're afraid to let it go because they're afraid of what's on the other side, right? Like this belief system, even though it hurts me, it made me successful. And so how can I let go? So what advice do you have for people like that? Well, I had a one, so I was teaching a Yale undergrad course on happiness and the most brilliant student, they're all so smart, right? But the most brilliant student in the class asked me exactly this. He's like, what got me here wasn't taking care of myself. What got me here was burning myself out. Like, what are you saying about me? Like, how, how can I believe you? And I was like, don't believe me. Look at the science. The science shows that when we take better care of ourselves, we show up as more emotionally intelligent, better decision makers with better cognitive faculties of attention, memory, focus. And we are um, uh, altogether much more able to handle the stressors of life. Okay. So, but I showed him the science and I, I, I've got the science already. You know, I, I wrote about it in my first book, The Happiness Track. I, you know, I talk a little bit about it again in Sovereign, my last book, but the science is there. If you're going to be in high stress mode and working in go, go, go mode. Sure. You might not notice the effect when you're 19 or 20, but believe me, you're going to be on the highway to burnout. And that's what we're seeing in all the other generations, people running around with adrenal fatigue, health issues, um, autoimmune issues, mental health issues, because that's what happens when you're constantly in a hydrogen mode. Anyway. So, but I said to him, don't believe me. Don't believe the science, but don't walk by the experiment. I was like, just be skeptical, but do the experiment. 
Mm. And I said, for this coming week, I want you to take care of yourself in some of the ways we talked about. Meditate and don't overwork, get your sleep, blah, blah, blah. He said, okay, fine. And he did that. And a week later, he came back and he said, Emma, I got my everything done and I got it done faster and I got to listen to the birds every day. Aww. And he went on to become a Gates scholar. Brilliant. Met, graduated summa cum laude, went to Cambridge University, like just beyond, right? And that's what I'm saying. Just because everybody is doing it doesn't mean it's the right way or the only way. You know, it's right. like when I moved from France to the U.S., I was like, oh, I moved to the U.S. I was like, oh, just because everyone's always been, I've always learned to do things in this sort of negative way, the way I did in France, doesn't mean it's the only way or necessarily the right way. Well, I'm asking people in Sovereign to question things, question self-loathing, question needing to be in go, go, go mode all the time in order to be successful, question the stuff, and then make up your own mind. And, and this is what the research shows, you know? And so I'm asking people to question this way of life and to see what happens when they do it differently. I'll give you one example. You know, so what do CEOs across industries and across countries look for in incoming employees? The number one thing they look for is creativity, right? Because if you can't innovate, it doesn't matter how hardworking you are or how honest you are, right? Who cares? You need to innovate to get past the competition. Okay, fine. Creativity. So then when do people get their best ideas? When they're relaxed or bored <laughs> or when meditating. I get my best ideas meditating. <laughs> exactly. And research shows and so neuroscience research shows that is when we get our best ideas, when our brain is in alpha wave mode, which mm. means it's not highly focused, like on a screen or concentrated, and it's not so passed out, you're about to go to sleep. It's in that in-between mode, alpha wave mode, where you are kind of like you said, daydreaming, meditating, not for fully focused. And research shows that is when we get our aha moments. So think about all those companies, Google, Facebook, other big companies that are hiring these, you know, Harvard, Yale grads to work, 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 being this high stress, <laughs> high drive. Really? Is that when you're going to innovate? No. People are more innovative when they've spent three days in nature, when they come back with 50% increased um, creativity, mm. you know? And so taking care of yourself, like you want to come up with better ideas. You want to come up with creative solutions. You want to write a book. You want to write a song. You want to do something cool. Spend more time in a meditative space or, or like you said, taking time off not being constantly on sweating, desperate for a solution. Yeah, I love this. Thank you. And I, I love that you have the research to back it up <laughs> because I think this yeah. is something that I've been intuitively understanding and trying to explore. But, you know, people who are so ingrained in this belief system, it's it's always a, it's a battle. It's like, oh, the old way worked. Oh, but, let, but it's not going to sustain me so well. Like it's detrimental to my health. So there must be a better way, but... I, I love the, the insight that you bring to this. Absolutely. Yeah. That's what I like to do is show the science. You know, I have a show me attitude. So I invite people to be skeptical, but at least do the experiment. Try it for yep. yourself. Okay. And then let's talk about resilience because I think that's also a very important factor um, that a lot of people want to be able to have. So what factors make people more resilient? And why, why are some people more resilient than others? Let's start with your second question. Why are people more, some more resilient than others? You know, if you were born and raised in a very stable environment where you felt really safe as a child, you may have a stronger nervous system to begin with because you've expected and experienced safety growing up. If you've been through a more difficult experience, either growing up or in your young adulthood, your nervous system may already be a little bit, have a little bit of trauma. In it, for example, we know that veterans who go to war and go through a traumatic experience are more likely to develop post-traumatic stress if they've had adverse childhood experiences. So it's almost like if you've been hit a bunch of times, you know, your nervous system, maybe you need to work harder at resilience, which doesn't mm -hmm. mean you can't become resilient. You can. Right. But I would say that. But then there's also individual differences, right? So in, in personality and physiology, some people are just going to be calmer. Other people are going to be a little more agitated. That's just individual differences. So your, your experiences, your individual differences come together here. And that's going to determine how hard you have to work at it. But then in terms of working at it, I would say one of the most important things you can do is condition your nervous system. And that's where things like br the, breathing, the, the, the breathing exercises, like the sky breath meditation, meditation, um, but also other things like exercise, spending time 
in nature, all those things that are physiological, because even spending time in nature is physiological. In my book, Sovereign, I was looking up research on grounding, you know, grounding is sort of a popular practice that you read about. It's like, oh, is this scientifically validated? Well, it turns out when you are walking barefoot on the ground, you're reducing inflammation at the cellular level. You're also spending time in nature, presumably. So there's something physiological going on. So those are some ways that you calm your physiology as well. I believe that making sure that you have the right kind of nutrition. So this is one of the things I covered in my book that I love too, is that nobody's marketing this to us, but research shows that the more fruits and vegetables you eat, the better your mental health. Mm-hmm. Who knew? Everybody's <laughs> like, no, take this pill. It's okay. like so simple a concept, but nobody talks about it. It's insane when you think about it because everybody's like, you know, I, I was just walking by someone playing the radio yesterday, like it was FedEx truck or something. And they're advertising some pill for some ailment. And then Longer than the advertisement is the 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 duration of the side effects. Uh, it's yeah. like longer than the I was like, this is mind blowing to me, right? But anyway, <laughs> lots of things being shoved at us um, uh, as solutions. But let's let's start with the basics. These are ways that we take care of our body and mind. And as we take care of our body, it also takes care of our mind. So there's that, um, and then these practices, uh, like I said, the breathing, meditation, and so forth. Um, and then other things include, you know, and you've probably heard about this, about, you know, gratitude and cultivating gratitude. Um, it's so easy for our mind to focus on the negative. And yet when we cultivate gratitude, and by that, I just mean training ourselves to think about what we're grateful for. You know, it's so easy, for example, to think, oh, I'm having a bad day. I have a headache or I, I got a, you know, a mean email from someone or something, right? But then reminding yourself, wait, 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 I'm safe. I have a roof. I have food. I slept in bed. Sun is shining. I'm doing better than 90% of the planet right now. Like I have nothing to complain about, right? I mean, really reality checking because um, we have it really good. We have it really good. And even if we're going through hard times, we probably have it better than the, often a lot of people on the planet. And always reminding ourselves of that can help shift us out of the negative mindsets. And I think gratitude is an element of wisdom. And in my book, Sovereign, I talk about this need for wisdom. In our society, so much media comes at us, so much junk food media. And why aren't we cognizant? Why aren't we promoting the millennia of wisdom that every human civilization has offered us? We're sitting on a gold mine from every part of the world. And why are we not prioritizing that? Why are we not reading that? Why are we not listening to that? Why are we not engaging with that? Because the junk food media is like junk food for our brain. Like you are what you eat is not just true of your body. It's true of your mind. If you're watching a lot of, if you're just scrolling through Instagram, looking at people, you know, doing makeup or, you know, whatever, you're going to feel like you're not enough and you're not beautiful enough and you're not whatever. Right. But if you're uh, choosing to read or maybe follow people who are offering bits of wisdom that enhance your life, that comes back in your mind later and is like, oh yeah, that was really useful. You're nourishing yourself. So how are we nourishing our minds? Um, and that's something I practice every day. I There's um, people that I follow. Like I have my, my own teacher, Gurudev Sri Sri Ravi Shankar. I listen to him on YouTube before I go to bed at night. Cause I'm just like, I want to go. Last thing I want in my mind is wisdom is wisdom that helps me become free. That helps me with my inner sovereignty. Yeah. I, I'm the same way. You have to be so intentional about what you consume f- food wise and media wise. And I, I think just the reason people aren't doing that is just their, the level of awareness, right? When you have, z- you don't have the awareness, you just take what's automatic. You, you, right? The junk food, junk media. And it's easier because it's right in front of you. They're selling it to you. The dopamine fix, like just all of that. But yeah. it takes a deeper level of awareness to search beyond that. And I, I think meditation is a, a beginning way to kind of build that level of awareness. Um, you touched on your lifestyle and routines. I'm curious, what are some habits or practices that you consistently do to keep up this, like just everything, the mindset, the the happiness lifestyle? Well, I start my days at 530 in the morning with two little boys and a cat jumping on me, So, <laughs> which is a nice way to start the day, but it's, it's 530. It's quite early. But once they're, you know, once they're settled in school or breakfast or something, I do a little bit of yoga. I do the sky breath meditation. I've been doing it every day for 20 years, ever since 
How long do you do that meditation for the sky breathing? The bre- that is 20 minutes. And then I do another 20 minutes of actual meditation after that. So okay, that's about 15 minutes right there. And then before I go to bed at one point in the afternoon or in the evening, I do another 20 minute meditation. So that's, that's just always there. Um, and then I also try to go outside every single day, even if it's just a couple walks around the block. I mean, I just to wait, A, to move, but B, I need like the sunlight. We know about the research on sunlight, but also nature. I need to look at some trees <laughs> and also be unplugged away from yeah. my computer. I don't take my phone. I'm just out mm-hmm. and just reset. Um, so those are things I do every day. And um, when I can, I also go to yoga class or do something else. And you know, I've got little kids and I do work. So I have, but I try to do breaks. I try to listen in. What do I need? You know, if I'm really exhausted, I'm not going to push through. I'm going to sit down, close my eyes for five minutes and just do a mini meditation or um, uh, listen to what, what I need, because I also know that's how I'm going to be most fueled for what I need to do next. So, and in terms of eating, I eat mostly, you know, I eat vegan, mostly fruits and vegetables and really attentive to the food that I eat because I had some health issues and I realized it's not an option. It's imperative um, to take care of this, to take care of this home. You know, the bodies are only home for life. <laughs> so Yeah, no, I, I love to hear it. I always love hearing people's lifestyles and routines because I think we, you know, you can learn this stuff, but how are you living this stuff every day? I think it's really yeah. important, like how we implement it. Okay, Emma, so if you can leave the audience with one final message today, what is that message? Yeah, so the quality of your Life depends on the state of your mind. You know, it doesn't matter what's happening on the in, on the outside. You have the option of being sovereign on the inside. You know, just like you can be on a beautiful beach in Hawaii and be upset. And it doesn't matter that you're on the beach, you're so upset. Or you can be stuck in traffic and playing music and dancing, being happy regardless of traffic, right? And that's good news because we can't always control what's coming to us from the outside. But what we can do is have a say over our internal state, our inner sovereignty through all the things that we talked about today. So I think that's, that's a message of hope. That's a message of, okay, I've got this. And no matter what happens, I can still nurture my inner sovereignty. Does that mean I won't fall? I won't get upset or I won't have periods that are really hard? No, but it means that you'll be able to get up again and keep going and remember the, the, the greater perspective. Beautiful. Beautiful. 